Uh, Marcus, can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the limitations of the PLI method in terms of mechanical limitations? How, how thin can you slice the data? And how do you have, then you have to appeal to optical approaches? So just talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so the mechanical limitation to date is uh, about 50 micron thickness for the large slices. Um, I think for mice and red we could go down to 30 micron with the PLI stuff. It is important that we have a large signal, as large as possible, and uh, the thicker the slice, the larger the, date, uh, the, the, the amplitude is. So um, this is another technical issue. Um, clearly, from the PLI point of view, we would also like to, to understand what's within one, one of these voxels. So we have started collaborations with um, people from uh, Florence uh, and uh, from Lenz Institute, and they are doing um, optical um, uh, fluorescence microscopy to photon microscopy on the same slices so that we start to learn what's even within our small voxels. And uh, there's a lot of um, um, work going on towards this direction. And it is clear that all these very high resolution data sets there will not be acquired for the whole human brain. But uh, we would like to understand what's, what's within a section thickness of 50 micron still, right? Um, in addition, if you would like to, to understand how the, the cytoarchitecture looks like in the brain, I mean, the, um, the big brain gives us information about um, the, the localization and the size of, the, of most of the, um, the cells. But currently, there's also a lot of uh, work ongoing to understand how can we scan through the different virtual sections so to come up also with a 3D reconstruction of the cells within each section. So there's a lot of uh, dynamics currently in this field. Um, yeah. Questions from the floor? Tristan? Question to Marcus too. Um, so in your presentation, you I'm interested by the computing challenge associated to uh, to PLI. In your presentation, you focused more on um, what I would call maybe one-off computations. Like you have to do these computations only once in the data set, and once they are done, you know they are not needed anymore. Do you also foresee that uh, these data, these type of data sets would be would require uh, computing power on a routine basis? Like if it would be integrated in Analysis pipelines, for instance, so you know, did, did you like I don't know if people wanted to register MRIs to 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 this data set? Yes. So um, I I had one one slide dedicated to the to the workflow process, and I I said that we put everything into an HF five like format and. Um, this will hopefully give us the possibility to, to make this kind of, of provenance, uh, to provide this kind of provenance um, uh, information throughout the whole uh, workflows. Um, and um, doing all these, um, so in the end we will, we will have to provide all this data to the people doing MRI and uh, um, I think the, the registration process itself from 3D to 3D, this is something which is currently also being targeted by the Human Brain Project and it's not, not really currently in our main focus. So that was the reason why I didn't focus on that. But um, we try to take care of all these provenance information also to be able to repeat uh, the same type of analysis after changing a single step in our workflow, a single software in our workflow, so that it becomes more intelligent that we say, okay, something in the middle changed, 
which type of data, which which modalities do we have to change or re recalculate? So this is what we are looking for, but we have not yet succeeded in implementing something like this. Stephen, let's Stephen have a go first. Oh, <laughs> um, I've tried to put what we heard in the morning together with what we heard in the afternoon, and it strikes me. It, it strikes me that no one really talked about the morning's issues, except maybe uh, Nico, I guess we can consider uh, matching the modeling, generational models to the data as an example of a form of replication, maybe. Um, but no one talked about, the re you're all representing the development of new methods, and no one sort of talked about reproducibility or replication. Is this because you don't consider them important as one of the first steps and we heard about some simulations that there'll be something that'll be done later down the road so should we think about these as very early things that would rule a particular methodology out or a particular software implementation out because it hasn't been um, demonstrated I'm, I'm curious to at, at the intersection issue between lots of new methodologies and those issues we heard about this morning if anyone wants to take that on. Um, so I would like to say something about uh, tractography algorithms and how they are compared and how the results are reproduced. It's something that um, started with the people that came up with the fiber cap uh, data set that I showed at the, at the last uh, couple of minutes. Um, so that has been, I think, extremely useful in, in the area of tractography because before that paper, before that study, there were so many tractography algorithms and, and nobody knew basically which one is better and how they... And, and I think um, that helped, that, that study helped a lot to... They had a competition basically, you know, for, for many different algorithms and um, for a given data set, right, for, for a given particular set of, of connections and otherwise. So I think it, it, it helps when um, communities basically agree to do this kind of competitions. By the way, this kind of competitions happen all the time in machine learning, um, you know, the, the deep learning community and more generally machine learning community, basically they have these annual competitions of envision in different uh, in natural language processing and so on. So I think it's not exactly related to reproducibility, but it's, it's related to figuring out what works and, and what doesn't work and, and which one is better um, between this large set of methods. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the, the reason no one's talking about uh, reproductions is because they're so boring. I mean, there's, there's sort of nothing new. You're just showing that what you've claimed before is actually true. And of course, that's really important, but it's also uh, not very inspiring, right? So we have to find ways of making that part of our workflow while still also keeping our focus on conceptual advances. And I think competitions are really a great thing. They've really boosted computer vision and this a rapid breakthrough with um, neural networks catching on so quickly was probably only possible because of secret held out sets that made it um, impossible to cheat on this and therefore very believable because even in computer vision and machine learning there's circularity going on and overfitting right and but but this is the way to really uh, make that impossible with secret held out sets and in neuroscience there have been a couple of uh, attempts in that direction, but it hasn't really caught on. But I think that should probably be a major thing to think about creatively, how we can uh, make that part of um, our uh, normal normal work and maybe have annual competitions like that with new data being added on major paradigms that are important and um, people competing with computational models to explain these data. So, uh, in the same sort of vein, I was looking to uh, pull together the two halves of the afternoon session, more imaging versus more statistical. And I'm, I'm wondering whether or not these new statistical approaches offer us something um, 
new to combine electrophysiological MEG type of data with fMRI data towards giving us better spatial resolution. This is an imaging session after all. We all know about the, uh, the problems of, uh, of uh, logothetis type problems that the neural data is very different from the vascular data that we draw our fMRI signal from. But do, nevertheless, if we ignore that truth and just try it anyway, might we see uh, better spatial resolution in fMRI data being uh, 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 built upon incorporating MEG, EEG data with these new statistical approaches we've heard about today? Or is it a bridge too far and the HRF will kill you anyway? Uh, well, I think that's a very complicated issue. Yes. Um, <laughs> we have um, I mean, yeah, vascular responses and, and electrical responses are not the same thing. And, um, you know, as I also pointed out in my talk, there is uh, limitations on the degree to which you can use bold signals to say something about uh, neural data. And even though this is extremely common in fMRI, for example, in most uh, functional connectivity studies, uh, make claims about uh, correspondence of neural activity, even though the signals that they're measuring are really vascular signals. So it might just be uh, similarity in the vascular response between areas that is driving these similarities. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, maybe higher resolution uh, data will, will help something. Um, but uh, I think we should really realize that, uh, that this is, a, in fMRI at least, that this is a vascular signal. Uh, maybe the future is really there. Um, I think that uh, there are interesting things to say about the brain just from the uh, relationship of about, about how neural activity relates to vascular responses. And there are many clinical situations where this doesn't work well and where fMRI could play a really important role. I, I would say uh, that maybe there is hope with the new methods and that one thing that also avoids this problem with uh, vascular and the confusion of the signals is this focus uh, that I think was really started with Nico's work on uh, sort of representations and information content rather than just the raw signals themselves. Because I think then by relating uh, the information content in different signals or the representational geometry, uh, I think uh, Nico didn't mention it today but he has a lot of work on comparing the modalities like this. Or oh, people have used RSA to do it. And I hope that with my method also we can do this looking at redundancy between individual time points, either of a whole helmet or a single sensor, and individual voxel responses. So I think that by focusing on this information content representation question that it uh, holds some promise. For so what would we need to, to be able to see in vivo uh, blobs and interblobs? Nico. <laughs> <laughs> I think the additional element that we need to consider is what is the purpose of all this, right? For me, the purpose is understanding computational mechanisms, and that means that ultimately we want models that perform the tasks. We want models that are AI systems, but that also explain neural and behavioral data. And those, if we take that to statistics, those should be our generative models of the data. Right? And um, constraining our model search to only things that actually can perform the task is an incredibly strong constraint. Right? So then we don't necessarily need as much data from our imaging technology. I think it's unrealistic to ask imaging technologies, even to photon uh, imaging to give us all the constraints for building our functional model of the brain. That's never going to work. This is always going to be a re reverse engineering challenge where we have to build something that actually works. And then if we have you know, a limited number, a finite set of functional mechanisms, then we can use forward models that simulate, for example, fMRI data or MEG or EEG data and they lose a lot of information, but they retain enough information, I think, to adjudicate between, you know, a thousand different deep neural networks that do the task. Is there a role for um, structural priors, big brain or PLI type data, within functional and data analysis? 
Definitely, I think we need all the constraints that we can get. It's a question. Uh, I have a follow-up question on the procedure for uh, increasing the temporal resolution of FNR. It was briefly covered before, but. Uh, how was the experiment performed? So there was an example that you presented a horse. Mm -hmm. And so was that stimulus repeated again? So was it the same stimulus that ah. was repeated every couple of seconds? Or it was a new stimulus? And again, it was presented periodically. So a person can anticipate that uh, the stimulus is going to be presented. So does that affect the results? Or uh, mm, yeah, that's, that's a good point. I mean, the, the experiments were done with different stimuli. Uh, the idea there is that uh, we are not we are interested in the general process of naming pictures or of language production and so um, the specific type of stimulus that doesn't matter and in a sense it's 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 the standard assumption in all experimental designs where you are comparing uh, two different experimental conditions that are composed out of different stimuli but you're you're not interested in the real form of the individual stimuli you're just Inter interested in the commonalities between all these stimuli and you know so it's 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 that standard assumption I think that is not strange uh, but then again um, in another presentation we saw that there were different responses to different kind of images so if you see a face versus if you see a non animate mm -hmm. object so wouldn't that distort the results uh, well I mean there might be small differences in the results in the in the response to say a horse and a and an animal, but or a, or a car, but I'm not interested in that difference. I'm interested in the general similarities between saying the name of those pictures in this particular data set. You know what I mean? So if I were interested in saying a horse versus saying car, I would have to do separate analyses for these two different types of stimuli. But because I'm interested only in, in naming pictures in general, I wouldn't do that. It's, I think it's a standard assumption. I was curious about the, um, uh, the, the, the models you're using uh, and the data. Uh, I think we're close to the point where we will be shipping data somewhere and it will be crunched by some uh, standard tools and uh, standard analysis. Uh, and or we would be like there would be like uh, some places where uh, you, you, you send your algorithm somehow, uh, and you know that's uh, how far in your kind of modeling aspects uh, are you from having somewhere like a, a science get get gateway somehow where you could push put those models and and and, ask, and say and tell people hey if you have data of that kind you can try those those models on, on them and. And how far are we to construct infrastructures where those models can kind of accumulate and, uh, and sort of uh, be compared like in almost like in the So that, that competition somehow is not like a really competition. It's just like, okay, this is a state of the art. Uh, I'm trying a new model uh, and I'm you know, pushing that to, the, to this infrastructure. And so how far in you, I mean, I can, because I don't have very much of an idea of exactly what's you know, behind what you're doing. Um, I'd like to see how, how far you think we are from that sort of endeavor. Yeah, I'm kind of dreaming of a website where you can upload um, data sets, brain activity data sets, together with the stimuli. So you're up uploading essentially um, images, because I'm, I'm studying vision, so images and brain responses together. And you can also upload models that process images. And when you upload a new model, then it's instantly evaluated with all of the data sets that are on the website, in the repository. And when you upload a data set, then all the scores of all the computational models are updated to reflect the additional evidence from that model. So this would be, I think, a dream. Um, how far are we toward that? I think there's still a number of steps to go, both in terms of agreeing with other people working in my field on the data format, you know, the um, practical issues. It's, it's certainly easier for the field of vision 
than for all of neuroimaging. The, the, the early on, the National Fmri Data Center failed in part, I think, because every experiment is very different and it's very hard to find a standard that encompasses all of cognitive neuroscience. I think within vision, we have a better shot at that. And there is a, a group of people who've been talking about this for a number of years and who love the idea. And um, I think we just have to get our act together over the, the next three to five years to actually build something like that. It'd be very interesting to see exactly what's needed for that and also be uh, like a, you know, focused on your field and then maybe there's an example for other fields to like a copy paste and, and adapt. Uh, and you know, be, I think that would be a fascinating uh, enterprise. Yeah. It looks to me like there are no more questions. I think people are punch drunk at the end of the day. So I'm going to uh, call it a day. I'm going to thank all the speakers for a very entertaining session. Thank you very much.